All right. Apparently drinking a Club Mate takes me more than three minutes, but <laughs> it also wasn't a full one. So don't don't worry about this. And but also please <laughs> don't take my career ad advice serious. Uh, but uh, yeah, so here we go for the uh, next part, which is about uh, iOS and macOS hardware interaction from uh, user space. So I'm a hardware hacker. So that means I want to buy iPhones, like give Steve Jobs all my money, uh, send it to heaven. No, I have no idea. Uh, so that I can break the most recent chips and that's really a thing here uh, because actually if you buy a dev kit, at least from the stuff that you can uh, buy from like normal vendors and not if you say like, hey Cypress, I know someone here, can you please send me something? But if you buy the stuff that's officially available uh, on the normal stores, then you would get very old dev kits in a lot of cases. Uh, so. Uh, you have to buy uh, something else like a smartphone and you would actually get a pretty decent and recent chip and this including a stack that works so it's not just a dev kit where you have to program each and every packet that you send but you get it integrated into a wireless stack that just works uh, and that's the reason why I really started using smartphones for my research. So if you buy an iPhone, that's basically, I mean, as, as long as you can jailbreak it, but uh, it's a research kit with the most recent Bluetooth and Wi-Fi combo chip by Broadcom. It's having, meanwhile, a 5G chip by Qualcomm. It's having the U1 chip uh, by Apple, so that's an ultra wideband chip that they built in-house, and an NFC chip. I think that one is by NXP, but I didn't do much with it so far. Um, so yeah, that's just the wireless chips. You just get a device with a collection of well-tested and integrated into a stack chips. Uh, so yeah, I have to deal with jailbreaks and everything and that's really annoying or with rooting Samsung phones, which, so it's also really, really annoying. But if I do this, I can access really all this hardware. That's super nice. Uh, so the goals for the hardware stuff here are, first of all, find chip interfaces, find protocol handlers, then decode proprietary protocols and also inject custom payloads. So that's what we want to do with the chips in the phone. So yeah, from user space, the question is why that? So the first thing is, let's say, if you have a crash and it doesn't matter if it's like in the baseband chip and you have comm center attached or if it's in the ultra wideband chip and you have the nearby daemon attached uh, if the chip crashes then the daemon would take care of uh, parsing the crash logs or if you send a packet to the baseband and the baseband does something and then sends something back and you need to send acknowledgements etc that's now all being taken care of the remaining logic in the daemon. So uh, yeah, because I'm lazy, I don't write uh, into a baseband crash log parser or a U1 chip crash log parser on my own, but I just use the one that's in the daemon uh, and that's it. And also I'm stuck with user space when using Frida because it only supports user space. So I cannot uh, modify the kernel. I can send something, of course, to the kernel interfaces. That's still great, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit limited. So now I say Star OS, which is like iOS, macOS, watchOS, everything. Uh, so the kernel below is very similar. So no matter if you are on iOS or macOS, most of what I tell here just applies to all of them. Uh, meanwhile, getting Frida to run on macOS got a bit annoying, like you have to disable system integri integrity protection and everything, but uh, then you have in the end something similar like a jailbroken iPhone, like all security 
disable, don't put your private data on it, but uh, you can use it for research, yay. Um, and most of the stuff that I'm going to show you now uh, is based on the uh, Saro S internals uh, by Jonathan. So that is like a really great book. It's a bit expensive and still stuck on iOS 13 and he doesn't plan to like update it, but it has a lot of interesting concepts that you can use and apply. And so basically I just learned that book by reading through it. And whenever I found something interesting, I started instrumenting it with Frida. So we somehow want to find like the data being exchanged uh, by iOS and the chips. Ah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, Alex just pointed out that like uh, the MacBooks without system integrity protection, that they are like not attacked by malware because malware thinks that uh, it's running on an evaluation machine. So uh, evaluation machine, I do the same <laughs> or about the same, but uh, actually I'm currently presenting from my test MacBook. Uh, and so the user is called test and I heard that like some malware even evaluates on users being called test, etc. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you are malware safe if you install the malware on your own. Probably, maybe. Yeah, not all malware. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we want to know the data that's now being exchanged with the chips and the demons. Uh, so prior to having any clue of how all of this works, what I just did was like, yeah, I use IDA Pro because I know how to use IDA Pro. Like I press F5 and then magic happens, right? And then I attach the iOS debug server and yeah, I just make a phone call or something and then pause execution a few times and set a few breakpoints and try to like see which code is being executed. And by this, yeah, you figure out the basement handlers, right? So, I mean, it's manual work, but it uh, kind of works. So even if you have like no clue at all, this, yeah, it, it works <laughs> and it consumes some time. So you need to figure out two or three days to find the according handlers, but yeah. Um, so it's better to understand like how it actually works. So let's say you have a process and yeah, the process is running some threads, uh, in between those threads, it's using the grand central dispatch. So this is the thing that the Frida Stalker is not going to trace this, uh, great central dispatch call here. And. Then we have another process. So that's also something that Frida is not going to trace because it now goes into another process. So it would have to be injected into the second process. And we have an XPC call. So cross process communication. Mm. So yet another thing where we have data. And in this second process, we also have threads that exchange their uh, stuff via Grand Central Dispatch. And if they interact with hardware, then most likely they are going to use the IOKit framework. So there's no guarantee that it will be exactly IOKit. There's also a few other things, but should be IOKit. And IOKit is using Mach messages. So that's like the universal thing that's being used. And then in the kernel space, you would have some IOKit user clients. So the idea is that the kernel exports some functions to be executed via IOKit. And then the kernel sends this to the chips. So this is the overall thing. And if we understand like data is basically always being exchanged, either using GCD within a thread or XPC within processes or between processes, and then uh, using IOKit ideally, because that's a bit easier to understand or like plain math messages, then we know where to hook. And we cannot hook into the kernel. We cannot hook into the hardware with Frida, but everything on top, we can just observe with Frida. And in the following, I'm not just going to explain these in a bit more detail, like to hook, how to hook into each of them and what you would see. Uh, maybe, I mean, yeah, I think Florentine already left because it's too iOS centric, but uh, so I think on Android, you would have like the hardware binder and binder calls, etc. So you have different 
implementations of more or less the same concept, like each operating system has like processes, threads, a kernel, something. So Grand Central Dispatch, uh, this one is actually open sourced uh, by Apple, so you can download it and look a bit into it. Um, so it's Apple's implementation of threading. Uh, and usually when you process data, then you would launch a new thread for processing data. So this helps to identify stuff uh, where yeah, data processing starts. And we can just try to hook into this. Uh, and the cool thing is with Frida, you can even print the queue name uh, so it can print strings and then it can also print the backtrace and with the debug symbol thing we can add symbols to this so it will become a bit more readable i even wrote some very basic script that prints lib dispatch uh, stuff so that's just linked down here um yeah then we can see what happens so we can try this in a moment but yeah so first of all one example uh where this is being used or being useful. So I said in the beginning, I had like not much of a clue how all of this worked. And I just like paused execution while making phone, phone calls in comp center. <laughs> and what you can use instead is now, we want to find like the uh, message handlers that parse stuff from the baseband chip in comp center. And the function here is the ARI host RT uh, inbound message callback or like one of the functions and we will be able to identify this like within seconds uh, in com center. Now I should not attach my Qualcomm iPhone 12, but again, my Intel, I hope that's the Intel iPhone. No, it might be that I cannot show this one. I'm not sure if I have <laughs> Intel or Qualcomm iPhones right here, right now. I think the one I have is also Qualcomm. Do I have an Intel one? Mm, nope. Ah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Alex writes, which uh, iPhones do I have? I have, so for the demos, I have an iPhone 8 on iOS 14.7 and an iOS 12 on iOS 14.2.1. And the issue here is I also have an iPhone 8 on iOS 8, but I would have to jailbreak it. I mean, that's just a few clicks, hoping that it doesn't break CheckRain, right? <laughs> or is it already? Oh, CheckRain is installed on this. No, uh, iPhone 8 is 50-50, so you have a 50-50 chance of getting a Qualcomm chip or an Intel chip. I have two iPhone 8, one with Qualcomm, one with Intel. So I just switched to the iPhone 8 that is on iOS 14.8 and jailbroken, and I hope it works. I've never tried it on this, but I mean... <laughs> <laughs> nothing nothing is real without a live demo that fails you would think that i do this every day but it's just in my history on my main machine so i never have to type this i just <laughs> look it up in history ah yeah okay same effect i ah, know we see stuff i just touched the phone and i moved it and that seems to be the thing so maybe the load was even correct before um yeah so sufficient i just press ctrl c no quit quit am i out here yeah um yeah so you can actually see the backtrace so i'm like a calling queue something something blah and there is a lot of handlers going on so it's you still need to scroll through this and uh yeah find it but uh Let's look for the ARI host RT. So yeah, so we have the ARI host RT call queue and there we get the inbound message. And I mean, yeah, you need to scroll a bit through this to figure this out and uh, find all of them. But yeah, it's more or less this uh, that you need. And you can see that there's multiple ones. There's also ARI host I IPC, which then goes, so there is a proxy which uh, between two different queues will uh, handle ARI and then over GCD <laughs> send it to another thread. 
So uh, yeah, it's it's all a bit crazy what's going on here. Uh, and if you have like way too many calls, so if you would run the script while fuzzing, uh, it doesn't work anymore. Like the throughput is too much and the target process would just crash or being killed by the out of memory manager on iOS, which is Jetsum. Uh, but yeah, so that's the idea. And uh, it's super readable, right? I mean, <laughs> at least from a reverse engineering uh, uh, context, like with all the names in here, um, you might have stuff with, without names. So yeah, here. So these are functions in Com Center, and Com Center is uh, not a library with exports, but except from this, it just works. All right, uh, yeah, so I just have like a second one. So for Bluetooth, you can do the same thing and then you uh, see that there is the Apple Convert transport at least on an iPhone 12, so iPhone 8 would yet be different. Okay, so next thing is XPC and XPC is uh, really awesome because processes interact all the time. So basically, uh, one process sends a message to another process. Um, this, not, this is the simplified view. So actually, um, when a process bonds and you, or like when, let's say, process A wants to send something to process B, but they don't have like an established connection yet, then the launch daemon uh, is the one that has permissions. So it checks permissions and establishes like the map ports in between. So uh, XPC is just map messages and it's all uh, abstracted via the launch daemon. But what you see from a process perspective is just you send something to another daemon. Uh, if the other daemon is not yet started, then the launch daemon would even start the other process uh, from, from what I understood. So yeah, it's a lot of magic behind, but you're just sending an XPC message. Um, and I mean, it's not necessarily wireless packets. So in the third part, we will have one example where like actually Bluetooth packets are exchanged between processes using XPC. But uh, most of the time, it's just some pre-processed information, some state information, or like, please start another process, something, something. Um, and uh, there are at least two XPC sniffers. There's one by Evil Penguin, and that's written in, I don't know, C, Swift, something like some low level language. Um, and it's fast. Uh, and then there's XPC Spy by Hotseed, who is working with NowSecure, who are uh, developing Frida. And he has one that's written in Frida. The Frida one is like conceptually slower so if you would use this on com center while uh fuzzing uh it's like uh it it might break but uh it's easy to use so that's the one that i'm going to show you uh really sometimes the target just crashes out of memory you can change the jetsum limits but uh yeah there is just too much XPC and it sometimes exceeds limits. Um, yeah, this, ah, no, yeah, it, it was just because of light mode. Um, so yeah, you can see a lot of content, like sometimes it's just, let's say some binary stuff that's uh, interpreted in the target, but it uses some kind of like also format with dictionaries or like a plist format, I think. Uh, Alex said he contributed to this, so he can probably explain it better than me. Um, but yeah, it's somewhat readable. Um, so you can see stuff that was um, exchanged between the Bluetooth D and other demons. And you can also see the other demons uh, process ID, etc. So uh, yeah, you can use this to figure out a lot of interesting things, I would say. And 
Yeah, now XPC means that processes interact with other processes. So when I fast com center, I actually got a ton of crashes in other demons. Com center communicates with the location demon because the baseband has location information. So the cell information uh, also has like a location code, country identifier stuff. Uh, there is the mobile internet sharing demon uh, that's also used by com center. There is the wireless radio manager demon. So you really have a ton of things. There's the, I'm not sure if iMessage agent or instant message agent or something, but it also parses iMessages and SMS or the IM agent. All of this stuff is like somehow connected. ABM Lite is the Apple baseband manager tool. Uh, it's just all interconnected. So you start fuzzing one large component, everything else would suddenly start to crash when it's connected via XPC. At least, like, let's say when it's not tested. So I was apparently the first person fuzzing com center and uh, then it goes a bit crazy. And also the thing is like Apple patched one of those bugs in iOS 14.6 and assigned a CVE. And then I asked them, okay, for which of all of those crashes was it? And they were like, yeah, it was in Wi-Fi. I'm like, yeah, okay, it was in Wi-Fi, but what in Wi-Fi? I even have like multiple here in the mobile internet sharing team and I have like no idea which of the crashes I report is the one that got assigned to CV. Now for XPC, the cool thing is like sometimes there is already a test interface. So you don't even have to write your fuzzer in Frida, but you can just like write something with Xcode um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so you have the Xcode stuff and just send your SMS through this, for example. So Natalie from Project Zero just uh, used this to simulate SMS. Um, but the thing is that the simulated SMS, they still go, at least they don't come from the baseband, they come from XPC. So they have a slightly different path during reception, but like later on when it will be sent to the IM agent, etc., it's like all the same. Uh, so you might have somewhat different behavior depending on if you use something that uses an exposed XPC interface that's exposed for testing uh, or the other way around. All right, uh, now the last lowest level part here will be uh, IOKit combined with Mach messages. So that's like really, really, really talking to the kernel. Um, so the idea of IOKit is, um, I mean, obviously you could uh, build a lot of device drivers just like freestyle and I don't know what, right? But uh, IOKit is a framework where you can have a function being exported uh, from the kernel. So it's an S method actually. And this one also has predefined argument type. So you can say this is an argument of the following types and these types are verified when they are called. So you can have a user client that exports functions that can be called that get checked against those types. So you have potentially less issues when implementing a kernel. So you have some security checks already. Um, obviously, if you have like a significant bug in IOKit that might even affect um, multiple uh, drivers or something, or if uh, like within a certain driver, like it's just type checked. So uh, you can still have something where like an int min int max something uh, would have an issue. So I think the issue in iOS 14.7.1 that fix was like in a driver when you would send it like the maximum value of something, then you could still get code execution. It also doesn't protect you like from uh, race conditions and other stuff, but it filters out a couple of issues uh, already on this layer. Um, so what I did here is uh, a script uh, iokit.js. Uh, it's partially uh, also built on stuff that a student Robert uh, did, but yeah, the, and combined with other stuff um, together with stuff that Dave did, but uh, yeah, a combination of a lot of stuff. And it's also on 
uh, GitHub on the same page. Now I need to grab my iPhone 12 because it has ultra wideband and go out of flight mode. Otherwise it doesn't have ultra wideband. Um, so let me check this. Mm, so I attach to the nearby daemon, which actually has a connection to the ultra wideband chip and say no pause and load the IO kit JavaScript thingy here. Yep, so the first thing uh, here that the script does is uh, getting the mappings. So uh, all user clients that are uh, connected. Uh, something that I think almost every daemon has is the Apple key store user client, but that's not relevant for the U1 chip. It's just like a client being in, in every daemon. Um, and then there is the Apple SPU uh, user client and the Apple SPU Rose driver user client. So there is actually two um, user clients being attached. And so I'm going to tell a bit more about this. I'm not sure if the slides are in the best order for this, but yeah, anyway, so you can actually see that there is some messages. So I have this IO uh, connect call method uh, to the SPU user client. It sends exactly one byte. Um, and that's what it does all the time because that's just the keep a light alive ping message. But um, if I start airdrop, uh, nope, because there is no other device that actually uh, has ultra wideband enabled right now. But otherwise, I would uh, see like even more. Why do I? Yeah, here is a dollar. So it starts a few more things. But uh, yeah, so that's the overall idea. And you can get at least the function calls out of this. And if you have a kernel with like symbols, etc., uh, then you can also get the function names because the index of the functions that are called is usually not uh, changing. So yeah, this uh, brace here just means an AP check-in. So that's one of the components of the U1 chip. And then in addition to all of this, you can also have uh, Mach messages. Uh, so everything is built on top of Mach and you can start <laughs> tracing this but uh, yeah there's a lot a lot a lot of data so it, because even xpc is encoded into Mach messages and it will just spam the system so that's like hook this for fuzzing or exchanging bits but probably not for printing all Mach messages uh so uh, as an example so this is a new part here that i haven't shown that much before like partially uh at uh Defcon Black Hat online this year, but not fully, is we want to re-instrument ultra-wideband. Um, so for those who don't know what ultra-wideband is, it's just, uh, they just use it for distance measurement. Uh, so probably there's no remote code execution in there because they really just exchange distances. But uh, even then, if you manage to manipulate the distance, you can steal cars. Uh, so this is more like about stealing cars than getting remote code executions still a very nice target. Uh, so the U1 chip has two parts, the application processor, so that's the AP check-in that you saw, the keep alive message. And it has a digital signal processor um, that has three RX antennas and one TX antenna. It needs three RX antennas because it can also measure the angle from which a signal came from and show direction information. Um, then there is an always on processor. So that's the thing running in your iPhone all the time, connecting to all kinds of chips so that the kernel can actually go to sleep. So the kernel does not need to handle everything, but if there is something, uh, so for example, also Siri, if you have Siri and say something, then the always on processor would wake up the kernel due to Siri. Uh, yeah, then you have like two user clients that we just saw in the kernel. So the Apple Rose driver user client and the Apple SPU user client. Um, that's via IOKit, via the nearby daemon. And down there, the always on processor. The always on processor has a corresponding user client, so to say. So the Rose and the Rose supervisor, uh, which correspond to the two above. Um, and you would see this for every 
RIT kit based chip, so almost every chip produced by Apple. So you have the same uh, for Apple's own Bluetooth chip that they call Marconi. Um, and this is the one that's, for example, in the HomePod mini or in uh, the AirPod, etc. Uh, and then in the opposite direction, you have the RT body used for logging, but that's nothing where you would call something. So there is no cause, there's just logging output. Uh, you can use IO rec, so the IO registry, to see uh, all the drivers and all the hardware, and you can see everything that comes via RTKit. So you can also double check which chips are connected via RTKit, and you would be surprised. Um, I actually can do this right. Mm -hmm. I should be able to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So here we go. Um, so that's not our ticket. That's scrolling a bit upwards. <laughs> yeah, so many drivers. <laughs> um, I mean, I can also just like go for uh, grab minus a three, so three lines after and RT buddy. Yeah, so um, yeah, there's various hit event user clients, so for human interface um, interaction, there was the audio controller. Um, yeah, too many duplicates basically, but you can imagine. So each of them is like a device being attached uh, via IT kit <laughs> and the always on processes are here, always on endpoint something, something. Uh, so it's really, really, really a lot. Uh, and now we want to actually send some commands to Rose. So Rose is just the code name for the ultra wideband chip. Um, and so we can say IO connect call method. And then uh, we have to provide uh, a Mach port and then a function index. I said they are like the same overall the, the kernels usually. So X rows TX is like the plain one that you would get. Uh, so here is a list of the ones that are exported. So you can see 18 or uh, 19 off by one uh, function calls being exported to IO kit. Uh, via the IO connect call method. That's rather unusual. So most IO kit drivers would just export a few functions that are rather generic, um, but that really depends on how much you want to expose uh, via this interface and how much of the parsing you want to do on your own in the kernel. Um, and then to the extra's TX, you would send some raw uh, payload and this is then in the end forwarded by the always on processor to the U1 application processor, which is then parsing this payload. So <laughs> lots of abstraction in between. Mm. Then, yeah, so it's yet another thing. So lots of abstractions in the kernel uh, and there's a second one. So if you want to send commands, so there's the second user client, uh, it has, fewer methods, so it's basically meant for setting and getting properties. And this one is, for example, the MAC address of the U1 chip. And the MAC address is something that not only the chip needs to be aware of, but also the always on processor when it uh, handles some of the stuff that comes in. And that's the reason why the property list is actually parsed in the always on processor and then uh, later on send as a command again uh, to the U1 chip is this yeah so it's also here so that's then 4012 being sent but n yeah so you could use the other one the xrows tx before to set the uh, MAC address of the device um, but in this case the always on processor wouldn't get it and then you get inconsistent states so yeah just two ways of interacting with the U1 processor and it's just for you to see one complex example. I mean, you don't have to understand it in detail, but uh, I have some scripts for this. Uh, and likely most communication with a chip that uses RT kit will look like this. Always via the always on processor, always some abstraction in between. Um, 
And then there are also some commands. Uh, so here, this one is uh, finally the one that we just saw for the AP check-in. So you can see here, that's the AP check-in uh, again being used by some user client. Um, so more or less, that's what you can see here. And for this, I should have a script that you can see all this in action. So, I mean, here, demo something, something, but let me try this. Um, and I want to use the uh, who grows controller libjs. Uh, did I go to flight mode? Nope. <laughs> the demo effect. Okay, so that was me unplugging the cable. Mm -hmm. It's not getting better. <laughs> it still says attaching. Uh, maybe the last script didn't like disattach properly or something. Uh, I should be able to use Frida kill. Uh, yeah, no process nearby. That's good because that means we have to start uh, something. Uh, yeah, so here we are. Uh, yeah, I had to kill the process. I'm also touching the phone and stuff like this, but uh, yeah, so here we go. Um, I'm actually also sending, so this stuff, you can ignore it. It's just me sending something to a Python script, but in between you can see like Apple SP user client perform command method and then saying AP check in, which is the usual thing you would see all the time. And now I need yet another phone. <laughs> um, with airdrop enabled such that I can start airdrop. Let's see. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe I should also in the script um, one moment. So I, I maybe just go make this smaller, go back to Xcode. And now you can see the effect that I can actually modify a script while it's being attached. So I go to this script and then I have some global variables that I can just change. So I say debug I it true so that it does more stuff. I just press save and in the same moment I press save, you can actually see suddenly there's more output here. Uh, so the script has been automatically reloaded. That's here when I said set symbols too. Um, that's the effect of reloading a script. Um, so I stop airdrop and I start airdrop again. And you can see once I start airdrop, I would see something like this. So this is not the peekaboo app. This is airdrop and it has an almost empty configuration for the so-called new service request. Um, I can also run the peekaboo app. Uh, which takes another moment. Yeah, but starting the Peekaboo app, was it this already? Yeah, it says initializing, but I need a second phone that has uh, the Peekaboo app installed. Yep. So this is the uh, configuration for the Peekaboo app, which has a few more fields being set, I think. Yeah, so more or less that's like the the concept here. And now I have to stop the Peekaboo app, yet another couple of stuff being visible here. Uh, of course, you have to start reverse engineering what all the stuff means that is being exchanged here. So, I mean, there is no magic that will tell you which value is what. You can actually use the uh, logging of the iDevice syslog uh, that will tell you a couple of those things and then like try to find the values in the raw system commands again. Um, 
So that's what I just did here. So basically in the syslog you would see we have, uh, I think it has generic ranging packet or something. And it sets some parameters like the preamble of the packet, the slot size, etc. And you can actually see this here. So I have a new service request with this long thing. And then the interesting part is it also has this uh, scrambled timestamp sequence. So this is the secret being used for the uh, distance measurement. Um, and that's what is appearing here again uh, in the uh, request. So we can now actually try to change some of those parameters. Like we can use another hopping pattern, another uh, transmission whatsoever configuration and see what happens. Um, so this is really, really nice here uh, just to experiment with the chip and send it other commands. And then there is one cool thing. Uh, so uh, there is two libraries uh, that ship with, so yeah, private frameworks library, something that ship with some symbols and that we can re-instrument. So these are the Liberos booter. Uh, I think uh, this is like on, on chip startup or also on update, if that's not the update to lib, but yeah, so there's like two libraries. It interfaces with the ROS controller lib and somehow not everything goes through IOKit, but they also have a plain Mach message callback because like use all the interfaces that you have, right? The weird ones and the not so weird ones, but <laughs> more or less that's it. Um, and uh, so the cool part here is the rose controller lib is exporting a symbol. It's called rose controller lib trigger crash lock. And it has a pointer to the current controller, uh, which we can intercept from other calls. Uh, and then here, this is a configuration like of the severity of the crash lock that we want to trigger. Um, and we can actually run this. So I, I will do this live, even though, I mean, I have it here on the slides, but uh, I mean, I already have this one open. Uh, so within the script, I can now say r dot trigger crash lock. You can see that this is a bit annoying while everything scrolls. Okay, now I just got an error message that is uh, like the rose controller pointer is not set. Uh, this is a typical effect that I get from my scripts because uh, what you can see here in my script, I just say, I don't know the Mach port yet and everything. And just on certain calls that I get, I would uh, assign them. So I would just go to flight mode and back from flight mode. Um, tons of messages. So that's a chip restart. Um, and then those things are set. And now let me try to trigger a crash lock yesterday and needed like two or three attempts for a nearby demon not to crash. <laughs> yeah, process terminated. This is, I don't know, uh, on iOS 14. Uh, yeah, so the R trigger crash lock is a function in my script. I can just go to this for a moment. Uh, uh, so trigger crash lock. So I'm just saying, uh, get this rose controller trigger crash lock thing. And I need to give it the pointer, which is set by toggling flight mode on off and the severity so that I can say fatal, non-fatal. But <laughs> yeah, so try this again. Uh, here we go. It's alive. Flight mode on off. I have no idea why it's more unstable on uh, the iOS 14.2.1. But yeah, here we go. Lots of messages. The chip just restarted from triggering a crash lock. Um, now we can SSH into it. And here I am already like, that was the one where I took a screenshot from, but this one we just got now. So that's from today, that's September 17. All right. And we can see, so there is a crash lock fatal AP one bin. There can, depending on the crash lock type, also be a DSP. Uh, this is just a large binary plop. It has a backtrace of uh, the crash um and even the thread state so uh florian actually built a script for this to parse them and also integrate some of the symbols that we have and then there's a summary json which just said like 
yeah, it was me triggering a core dump. But if you get a normal uh, chip crash, then this one would even contain like the uh, assertion that led to the crash. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I do most of the time. Yeah, just trying to figure things out. It's not as simple as just calling this because um, the issue here is to actually get the log, you need to also set a few global variables like this is a nearby daemon internal build uh, that allows writing crash logs to a directory. Um, you can also see that the rows firmware logs.bin is empty, which is, I think, not the fault in my script. It works flawless on iOS 13.3, where we have a U1 debug build. It just does not work uh, on recent non-debug builds. So you need a debug build to get a firmware log which uh, contains way more information about like, uh, yeah, basically logging of the firmware. Uh, yeah, so there's the rows measurement engine. Basically what I do here is like the U1 chip reports the distance um, and the raw timestamp format allows a distance of minus 65 kilometers or something, uh, but you would see uh, that you can actually not get closer than half a minus half a meter. And also if you inject wrong measurements, it cannot deviate more than like one meter from the mean of the last 11 measurements, etc. And this is stuff that you want to figure out. And uh, so for this, I have one last script that I'm sharing. So that's like the last thing that I'm going to show here before the next break. Uh, which is the measurement engine. Uh, so here, that's what I did for the screenshot. Uh, I just overwrite uh, the range results right before it's being handed over, but this is not what comes from the chip, but already something in between during processing. So instead, what I did here is like, I say I want a distant sequence. So let's say these are measurements reported by the chip, and I want to see like, what does this result in? Um, so let's maybe use this version. I put this one in the front. Uh, so basically if I comment this out and save this one, you can see that it converges like to lower measurements and like switches in between. Um, so we can just try like different uh, sequences of measurements to see what, what happens in here. Uh, like this one con converges to uh, like 10 meters. Um, I think I can even say it, this one to true. I'm not sure if this is going to crash my script somehow. Mm. Will it be all random? Yeah, so now it's like all random values. And of course, I can now also like watch my iDevice syslog to see like what is happening when I fake those distances, which measurements are accepted and forwarded, which aren't. Um, so it's really a useful application just for debugging ultra wideband. All right, so here we can like see all the U1 measurements, something, something. Uh, and then uh, we should see, so this is the range measurement that I just injected with the wrong value. Um, and then it might say uh, here, uh, range offset exceeds a maximum from the mean. So it does not say mean here. And then it says like, not okay to publish to the client. So these are like the messages that we get upon like fake injections of such values. And the cool thing here is like, we don't have to do this over the air. Like we don't need to have a successful attack on the U1 chip to debug this whole measurement engine. Instead, I can just like hook with this uh, uh, using Frida, hook into this and uh, yeah, that's it. All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm just testing the measurement engine with, with Frida here. So that's just a screenshot in case the demo fails, but it didn't fail. 
Uh, yeah, and with this, I'm going to conclude the stuff. So first of all, we need to find like chip interfaces for IO kit, Mach everything. We can even find protocol handlers by using this GCD tracing because a new thread usually means processing new data. Uh, we can decode proprietary protocols as I have shown like for Ari just briefly, but also for ultra wideband um, because there is typically some information in there and we can also inject uh, custom payloads. So, I mean, it of course depends a lot on the chip and so on, but uh, it's really cool to debug this and figure details out. All right, so this would be the second part of the uh, workshop and it looks like we are going to take a bit longer uh, because I talked too much and uh, clicked too much and it took a bit longer uh, for the third part. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions so far, uh, feel free to ask. So in Frida, if you say, so the question by Alex was like, my hex prints look so nice. Uh, that's just Frida. If you use Frida to print uh, binary data, then it uh, shows this stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, what, what I do here. So, I mean, somewhere I have the uh, debug print of the ROSE controller. It's really simple magic somewhere. I'm not, I'm not good at coding, so <laughs> don't blame me for this stuff, but where is it? Uh, mach debug I uh, So if I have this, it just has like one check here. So all I say is like uh, console log read byte array. And as long as you leave something as a byte array and don't uh, convert it to, so byte array is a Frida uh variant of representing data and it's not a standard javascript so as long as you don't convert data uh but leave it at the byte array and you print it you get a hex dump print 